fact, we come to the last and the most important session. We we have with us uh, Manoj Keval Ramni, who heads the China Studies Program and is also the chairperson of the Indo-Pacific Research Program at the Takshashila Institution. Institution, and uh, it is a leading uh, Indian public policy think tank. And I'm happy to say that I'm also an alumni of this great institution. <clears throat> Uh, to just briefly introduce Manoj, uh, his research covers Chinese politics, foreign policy, and uh, approaches to new technologies. He curates a weekly brief, uh, Eye on China, so which tracks developments in China from an Indian perspective, So, which is going to be important for this conference. Uh, he's also the author of the recently released book, uh, Smokeless War, uh, China's quest for geopolitical dominance, which discusses China's political, diplomatic, narrative responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it will be very interesting. Uh, so prior to joining Takshila, Manoj spent over a decade working as a journalist in India and China, where he helped set up uh, digital newsrooms and train young journalists. So uh, Manoj will use a couple of slides and make his presentation for about 50 to 55 minutes and which will be followed by question answer sessions. So do post your questions uh, as you've done for the entire day. In fact, uh, Manoj, I must say that uh, the response and the quality of questions were really good. So we look forward for your inputs. So, um, I mean, but if you want to ask, uh, raise and ask, please raise your hand. We will unmute you and you can ask directly also. So over to you, Manoj. I mean, we can start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sridhar. Uh, thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, thank you to ISP and to the US Council for arranging this. This is, um, is that, it's really exciting to be here. It's, uh, I was thinking through the day that, you know, this is the last session of the day. Um, and how do you make it engaging, given that it's probably been quite a long day for people. Um, so I'm hoping that that will be the case. I'm hoping that this will be engaging for all of you. And I'm hoping that uh, once I'm done presenting, we can have a nice exchange uh, because I'm going to be talking about a bunch of different things. Uh, and I'm hoping that I, I'm hoping to sort of also hear your thoughts about them, which can help me further my work uh, and my research into China. Um, so I'm just going to start sharing uh, my screen to begin with. Uh, okay. I hope you can see my screen. Okay. Yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. So let me just begin with uh, uh, a brief sort of look at uh, the structure of the presentation that I'm going to be talking about. Three broad areas that I'll be covering. First is, uh, you know, the evolution of the Indo-Pacific strategy. When I use the word strategy as a singular, I'm predominantly talking about the United States of America, uh, but there are multiple different Indo-Pacific strategies uh, over the years, over the last couple of years, so very rapidly uh, for, a, for a number of different countries. I mean, India doesn't have a formal strategy, uh, but the vision that we've had, uh, that the government has put out was, uh, during the Shangri-La dialogue when the prime minister made that speech a couple of years ago. Uh, but in the US, we've had uh, sort of some documentation of a formal strategy, uh, but we don't have one document which says this is the United States of Indo-Pacific strategy as far as I know. Uh, but in other countries, we've seen sort of clear documents come out at least of strategies. So I'm predominantly going to be talking about uh, the United States of Indo-Pacific strategy and its approach to the region uh, evolving uh, because that's what's essentially animated a Chinese uh, view of the region. Um, as you all know, China even today does not formally acknowledge that there is something called the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it still talks about the Asia-Pacific. Um, so it doesn't even sort of, whenever it has to talk about the Indo-Pacific, it uses uh, you know, Chinese officials and academics uh, would use the phrase so-called, that will be the uh, you know, descriptor before it. Um, so yeah, but it's essentially driven from what, uh, based on what the American uh, government did under Donald Trump and now under Joe Biden. Um, and the third thing that I'll talk about is how COVID uh, and sort of the post-COVID environment has sort of shaped Chinese perceptions, its sense of threats, its sense of opportunities, and what have been the responses 
uh, of the Chinese government, therefore, what have been the policy measures that have been adopted. Um, so yeah, so that's the structure of the presentation. Let me just quickly get on to uh, the evolution of the Indo-Pacific strategy from the United States, the way I understand it. So this is obviously uh, a quote from the December 2017 US national security strategy. Uh, it spoke very clearly about, uh, you know, it sort of articulated a vision for the Indo-Pacific. It spoke about the threat perceptions from uh, in the Indo-Pacific. But about a month before this, uh, then President Trump was visiting uh, East Asia, and he'd spoken about uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, and that's sort of, you know, you've got the first feelers of something coming out far more formally, uh, and, you know, that's having policy impact going down the road. But it's sort of clearly, if you can see in this sentence, and we've seen, uh, you know, the Biden administration also adopt uh, some of this language when it talks about a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, so there is continuity in policy. Um, but you can see in this that there's a, there are two really important things which I've highlighted here. First is that it needs to be free, uh, and there are different visions of what the region would be like. Uh, and secondly, it talks about why is this region significant? It is because it is the most populous and economically dynamic part of the world. Um, the third, obviously, important reason is that also it is home to what is uh, an emerging rival, if not an arrival that has already emerged. Uh, but so, I mean, to, to my view, it's still emerging, uh, but it's an emerging rival and emerging threat. Uh, to what has been uh, historically, at least since the Second World War, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. has been the preponderant power in the region. And today what we're seeing is that China is, uh, China's rise uh, and Chinese policies associated with its rise have been challenging that preponderance. Um, subsequently, in 2019, we had the first sort of document, which you could call as a cleared articulation. Uh, this is by the U.S. Department of Defense. It talked about... Uh, you know, it was titled the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report. It uh, termed the, and you know, prior to this report coming out, uh, you had the Indo-Pacific Command that was set up. Um, so the Pacific Command became the Indo-Pacific Command. And then you have uh, the Indo-Pacific in this document being termed as a priority theater for the DOD. Uh, you had a clearer definition of objectives, which were, uh, you know, I've summarized them here. It's quite a long document, but they were basically talking about how they want to advance U.S. interests to, uh, for preserving a rules-based international order premised on shared interests and values. Uh, the key challenges in the regions were a revisionist China, a revitalized Russia, and North Korea. Um, and the objective was to pursue a three-pronged approach of preparedness, partnerships, and promotion of a network region. So this was very, very clear that, you know, even under the Trump administration, uh, the approach was very clear that you need to not just uh, reorient for new challenges in the region, uh, but uh, you're recognizing that China presents a key challenge and it's a revisionist power. It's looking to alter the status quo in the region. And also the fact that you need to be working with partners. And that document identifies a bunch of different partners, which apart from traditional U.S. allies to even countries like India and others. And it talks about the promotion of a network region. So you're essentially talking about a web of partnerships, uh, which will be key to not just uh, preserving U.S. interests and furthering U.S. US interests, but also, you know, which would be, which would, who would come together with a shared set of interests and values to shape norms in the region. And why would you want to do this? Well, you would want to do this because you are perceiving that there is a change to those norms that are taking place. There's a change to the balance of power that's taking place in the region, owing to the rise of China in particular. Now, what did we see actually in terms of policy as this happened? Again, you know, uh, I spoke about December 2017 as the national security strategy. This is June 2019. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, you know, uh, President Biden came to power in Jan 2020. Uh, the elections, sorry, uh, yeah, the, the elections happened uh, in November 2020. President Biden just came to power in Jan 2021. So there was a very short span of time in which all of this was happening. And there was a tremendous amount of uh, chaos also within how the Trump administration was operating. So when you assess uh, the Indo-Pacific policy, if I could say that at that point of time, what you saw was that there were multiple different imperatives. And this is, I think, a theme that you will hear throughout my presentation, that foreign policy does not operate in isolation. Uh, a domestic policy and domestic imperatives are key. It's not sufficient. Uh, you can't sort of firewall these two. Uh, and we saw this playing out uh, in the last uh, four years during the Trump administration in the United States, where, you know, uh, issues like reciprocity uh, in trade, particularly 
burden sharing with regard to security issues in the region, uh, the withdrawal from the TPP, uh, and subsequently the withdrawal from different of you know sort of multilateral multilateral organizations, and a sense that there was transactionalism in uh, engagement uh, created a certain degree. Created it made it very difficult to sort of pursue the kind of partnerships uh, that were being talked about, right? So if you're looking at partnerships and if you're looking at shared interests, but you're emphasizing uh, reciprocity, which is really difficult given the differential uh, in economic power between the US and some of the countries in the region, military power between the US and some of the countries in the region, and also the conventional and traditionally established nature of some of these security partnerships. Um, you know, uh, when you're sort of changing the sort of uh, lodestone for those partnerships, it's going to become difficult and it's going to become chaotic. And we saw that chaos, therefore, resulting in a sense within the region about, uh, you know, U.S. policy being uh, somewhat mercurial, increasingly transactional, uh, and that therefore creating a certain degree of uh, resistance also, while there was obviously deep concern about China's rise and China's assertiveness. Um, the other aspect of, of the Trump era policies was that, um, you know, at the end of the day, it seemed like, and the way policy was even uh, enacted, and if you can see the line before, which is reciprocity burden sharing, when you saw all of that from the point of view of actors in the region, it seemed like countering China was the primary objective of the Indo-Pacific policy, as opposed to building strategic congruence uh, with regard to their shared interests. So if trade and economics is a shared interest and different countries in the region are feeling uh, the heat from China's economic policies, then uh, you know, it's not beneficial to them if they're also, if they're sort of a key partner that they are admittedly looking to balance with, uh, the United States uh, is also becoming transactional or is pulling out from the region. So that sort of became, it made it much more difficult for countries in the region, therefore, to collaborate far more effectively um, because you also found a sense of unpredictability in terms of how what would happen. Um, and again, uh, government policies may change, uh, you know, with administrations, but uh, if there are such, if there are wild swings about committing to a mega deal and pulling out of that, it ends up creating a deep sense of unpredictability. Uh, and that sort of uh, is really, really challenging for actors in the region. So that was another region, reason, right? And obviously, the Beijing sort of used this uh, somewhat to the narrative of, you know, you need to be dropping Cold War, menta Cold War like mentality. There is little appetite in uh, the broader region to engage in sort of another Cold War. Um, but the idea that if the Trump administration was moving from the point of view of countering China rather than building a, but rather, rather than understanding strategic needs of actors in the region, that sort of made. Uh, cooperation that much more difficult. Um, on the flip side, on the positive, uh, what we did see was that uh, from a defense point of view, there was deeper collaboration. This was the case with India, where foundational defense agreements were signed. This was the case with the quadrilateral uh, group, uh, the Quad, uh, Japan, Australia, the United States, and India, where you know there was a greater congruence of uh, there was a greater congruence at least in the understanding of the threat perception. Uh, and we saw much more sort of active steps being taken with regard to better interoperability exercises and so on and so forth. So we saw some positive movement in that direction. But uh, a lot of, if you go back and see what uh, the Indian Prime Minister had been saying at that point of time, uh, the vision was it had to be more than just a military or a defense partnership if you were looking at the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the relations had to be much more. And you know, if you follow the news in the last couple of days, what you've seen is Secretary Blinken quite clearly saying that this is not a military alliance, we're doing many other things. Uh, and the evolution has been that way, um, which gets me to sort of the Biden era. Uh, what you've seen is that we've seen, uh, you know, increasing focus in the Biden era on uh, competitiveness, uh, partnerships and values. Uh, competitiveness, uh, from what I understand, is not being defined just as uh, the US being much more competitive with China. It's also about the U.S. being much more competitive, drawing strength domestically from its domestic economy and investments at home uh, to begin with, to curtail COVID-19, uh, to do the vaccinations and to launch a stimulus package, uh, launch the jobs package and the rest of the actions that you've seen in the last six to eight months, uh, you know, six months or so uh, under the Biden administration. We've seen a clear focus on en uh, enhancing partnerships. Uh, you know, uh, even before President Biden was elected, you saw a lot of talk about uh, 
you know, uh, needing to revitalize America's traditional partnerships. And you saw that, you, we've seen that in the last six months, right? If you go back to January and just look at the calls that the president made uh, and the Secretary of State and the Defense Secretary and all of them, uh, what they've made, uh, the calls that they've made, the conversations that they've had, uh, they've essentially been about refocusing America's engagement with its allies and partners and starting to take action uh, together. Uh, we've seen this in the context of at least the, the sanctions that have been applied on China with regard to human rights issues. Um, so we've seen some degree of congruence being built. Um, and of course, values, uh, you know, the Biden administration has put values at the center stage. Uh, and we've seen that sort of contestation with regard to human rights uh, and tangible action has been taken in the form of sanctions that we've seen. Um, all of this obviously uh, fits in the narrative of the United States under the Biden administration saying that they want to act from a position of strength. Because this is where they see their strength being, uh, you know, this is the sort of driver of uh, the United States strength, which is uh, increasing its economic, uh, technological, uh, systemic competition uh, by investments at home, uh, expanding its partnerships and emphasizing values. Uh, and from that position of strength, you sort of shift the balance of power, uh, which increasingly was uh, drifting, uh, you know, in China's favor in some way, because uh, of the lack of engagement uh, in multilateral agencies and the sort of friction with allies and partners that we saw in the last, uh, uh, in the previous administration. Um, and also what we've seen is that uh, there has been a shift to not place the Indo-Pacific policy under, from through the prism of China, but actually look at China through the prism of the Indo-Pacific policy. And this to me is still work in progress. Uh, there's still lots more to happen. It's still really early days. Uh, but what we've seen is really encouraging in some ways, right? What we've seen is that uh, uh, un under the Quad, we ended up having these three different working groups that were set up. Of course, those working groups need to deliver much more, and the summit in September will hopefully hopefully come up with more deliverables. But uh, what we've seen is that the focus of that was vaccines, climate change, uh, you know, emerging technologies, all of which uh, uh, are much broader than just China. This is about the future of the world, and this is about a set of countries coming together to saying that, look, we need to be working on these critical issues, uh, you know, because we need to be shaping the agenda rather than responding to agenda setting by, say, China or Russia or somebody else. Um, so to me, that's why I feel that there is an attempt to try and place China policy within the broader prism of Indo-Pacific policy as opposed to the other way around. And that, uh, my sense is, will be received and has been received far more positively in the region. Um, but there's lots more to be done. Um, but this is, like I said, early days for all of this. So that's my sense of how the Indo-Pacific strategy has evolved by far. Um, I've spent some time talking about this basically because uh, you need to understand this shift for, you to be able, for me to be able to talk to you about how China perceives all of this. Um, so yeah, this is uh, Secretary of State Blinken. He said this uh, more than once. He said this even before he became Secretary of State. Um, and this is a useful framework to understand how the United States is approaching China right now. Um, how effective the policy will be, is, you know, time will tell. But at the end of the day, what we do know is that, you know, there will be competition, there will be collaboration, and there potentially could also be uh, an adversarial approach in different ways. Um, and I guess the Chinese would see the sanctions that have been applied as adversarial. Um, but it's useful to keep this framework in mind from an Indian point of view also, because often our public discourse can swing from, you know, extremes from one extreme to the other. And I think we saw this during, uh, you know, and I think that was a lesson for both the United States and India and for China. Uh, what happened in late April and May when the second wave hit India um, and there was this uh, demand for vaccines and, uh, you know, the United States to liberalize export policy. And you saw immediately sort of public discourse in India start to shift uh, uh, so the next time, uh, if there is uh, a deal between the United States and China, whether it's with regard to climate change, whether it's with regard to uh, Iran, whether it's with regard to Afghanistan, or whether it's with regard to technology or trade or any one of those things which today, uh, you know, uh, are being discussed, um, I hope that Indian public discourse does not shift from the point of view of, oh, look, they are cutting deals and therefore fundamentally policy has changed. Uh, that's not true. Uh, it's very clear the United States is telling us that you know, it will be collaborative where it can be. Um, uh, so I think you need to be sort of mindful of that while you uh, assess US policy going forward, uh, because that's also important from our point of view and how India reacts in response. So how, did the, how have the Chinese perceived all of this? 
Um, so I look at it from three points of view, which I've mentioned here. One is that there is a certain degree of, uh, and there was a certain degree of ambivalence to begin with. You know, I'm talking 2017, 2018. Um, subsequently, there was a clear effort put in to carry out assessments of what exactly does this Indo-Pacific strategic shift mean? Uh, and thirdly, we've seen policy adjustments. Um, so this is obviously the infamous quote by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, where he spoke about how, uh, you know, uh, there's never a shortage of headline grabbing ideas and they are like sea foam in the Pacific or Indian Ocean. They may get some attention, but they will soon dissipate. Um, he subsequently, in the past year in particular, uh, referred to the Quad as uh, an attempt at an Asian NATO. So clearly he's changed his view. Um, but it just is, is symbolic of the early ambivalence that Beijing had with regard to uh, the Indo-Pacific. And uh, in many ways, that's because uh, there was no meat on the bones uh, or, or there was very little meat on the bones. And even if there was meat on the bones, there was so much friction between the United States and its partners and allies that uh, the Chinese sort of saw opportunities uh, far more evidently. Um, but this is essentially how it began. Um, subsequently, sort of, I've spoken about the idea of conceptual immaturity. Uh, that's what, that was one of the arguments that you saw in Chinese, uh, you know, official discourse, although they officially they did not speak about the Indo-Pacific uh, as a construct at all. Uh, but there was clear understanding that this is a geopolitical construct, but we don't know, and it's a geopolitical construct which is targeted at China, but uh, we're not sure if this is a grand strategy, if this is a sh complete shift which is going to, uh, you know, uh, and why do I use the word grand strategy here, which is going to be the sort of fundamental centripetal force around which the United States will reorganize itself in some way, not just in terms of its sort of forces abroad, but also how it becomes a driver for social, economic, technological reorganization. And therefore it drives legislation, it drives industry, uh, and it drives industrial policy. Uh, and of course, uh, military strategy, diplomacy, and everything else. Um, that whether this will become that central driver or that you know, centrifugal force, which is going to force, uh, lead to a reorganization in the United States for a new challenge. Whether it's that, or whether it's simply uh, a brief seasonal reorganization, uh, which is sort of pivot uh, to Asia, which was un announced under the Obama administration, uh, and pivot plus India to some degree, uh, or is it something much deeper, much bigger? Um, and I think there was a tremendous degree of ambivalence that existed in China with regard to this. And to me, uh, fair play that that ambivalence existed because uh, it was still really unclear how US policy was going to evolve. We were seeing that competition with China is becoming far more intense. Uh, but again, you go back to that moment where you wonder whether there will be transactional exchanges, uh, whether there'll be sort of some sort of a grand bargain. Uh, and you know, for countries in the region also, you're looking at all of that and you're seeing that you wanna hedge your bets rather than sort of throw your lot in with one side or the other right now. Uh, and at any point of time, if you find yourself in that position of throwing your lot in, uh, it can be really difficult for you. So that was sort of playing out uh, in China also. They were trying to figure out what exactly was happening. Um, but certain things were clear, that there was a targeting of China and there was a uh, elevation of China as a threatening actor. Um, the other thing that they looked at was that, uh, well, there were multiple strategies. I said this before. Um, it's not just one Indo-Pacific strategy. I mean, Japan had a different approach in some ways. Australia has a different approach. India has a different approach. Each country comes to the region with a different set of uh, advantages and disadvantages. Each uh, country has different sets of threat perceptions. So for example, India and Japan have a very different sense of threat perception with China uh, compared to say the United States or Australia, uh, or for example, France. Uh, the threat perception is very, very different and that's because of our history, our geography, our economics and all of that. Um, so, the, so the Chinese were also sitting and observing. They were also sitting and observing and examining the different strategies of different countries and the different motivations that they bring to the table. Um, there was a uh, clear, there's clear evidence that there was an attempt at uh, 
you know, sanctioning a lot of studies to go and try and figure out uh, what exactly is shaping the environment. Um, and there was a lot of internal debate within official China also. Um, it was not uh, unitary, uh, sort of, it was not a unitary top down understanding. There was clearly uh, friction between different officials, different departments, uh, different agencies. And I'll just give you one example of this. So, this is the uh, now former ambassador to the United States, uh, who in October 2017, just before you know, the, end of, uh, the sort of the national security strategy comes out in the US, um, he's talking about how, look, uh, we can work together, we can sort of figure stuff out and we can uh, accommodate each other's interests, which is predominantly uh, a message to the United States to accommodate Chinese interests far more. Um, but it's a message of accommodation on both fronts as opposed to what we have gotten used to say in the last couple of years, the sort of aggressive voice of wolf warriorism. In comparison, one of the gentlemen who I would classify in the categories of wolf warriors, uh, you know, the Chinese ambassador to France, uh, he was very, very clear in 2019. This is when sort of, uh, you know, it's some, in some ways, it's clear that there is a uh, contest which is far more intense than, you know, was earlier presumed. Um, but despite that, this is December 2019. In January 2020, you saw the phase one trade agreement uh, that was signed between the two sides. But despite that, look, you can see that there was this sort of a perception that had set in, and of course, in some quart official quarters in China, that uh, you know this is something that is going to be fundamentally problematic uh, for a Chinese strategic interest point of view. Um, but my point, the purpose of highlighting this is to tell you that uh, there was clearly an internal discussion, debate, conversation going out, going on in China among within the official circles and also within academia and, and among analysts about what does the Indo-Pacific strategy mean for the United States and for others, and how does it impact Chinese interests and therefore what should be China's policy response to this. Um, and when I talk about policy response, I mean, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, another set of examples to just show you how the debate played out. So this is a collation done by Po Ma in his uh, paper uh, where he talks about China's fragmented approach to the Indo-Pacific. So this is just a, Example of, you know, the moment you see the strategy get cleared, it sort of get mentioned in official documents, you start to see far more uh, research work. And this is research. These are articles from CNKI, which is uh, deeply researched articles uh, in terms of what's happening in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so you can see that there's a trend of it becoming a much more popular research topic. Um, if you look at the affiliations of the authors uh, who are conducting this research, um, you know, Yes, an overwhelming number of them are with universities, but also if you can look at it, you know, a significant number of them uh, are with government think tanks and obviously cash. Um, so there is money that's being spent from the big national social science funds to be able to understand what's going on, um, to then obviously come up with some sort of a cl clearer understanding of how do you respond to this. The last sort of example of this is, this is the nature of the studies that were conducted. Um, and it again clearly shows you, to you that there was an effort to try and understand what's happening with the United States, what's happening with India, Japan, so different countries, um, uh, and also in terms of sort of the politics of the Indo-Pacific and what sort of aspects can, can impact China's interests. How did we see policy respond? Uh, so what we saw in policy was some degree of continuation, but some degree of adjustment also. Uh, what we saw was that we saw uh, traditionally where China's core interests are concerned, um, you saw a tougher approach continue, right? You saw a much more hard kind of approach continue. Um, so in the South China Sea, you saw uh, China consolidating much more. Uh, it did not sort of, there was no tactical adjustment. There was no sort of, uh, you know, letting go of the advantage that you have. Uh, in fact, there was an effort at consolidation, not just... Uh, I can't use the word on the ground, but perhaps on the ground, given that there are so many artificial islands now, but uh, in the waters of uh, the South China Sea. At the same time, there was an effort to sort of launch this uh, code of conduct, sort of renewed push behind the South China Sea code of conduct, which uh, as we see from the kind of uh, conversation that's going on, uh, essentially cements China's uh, uh, hegemony in the South China Sea region. Uh, by sort of disallowing others 
to uh, conduct military drills or by disallowing uh, what are called external actors uh, from even carrying out exploration in the waters of south china sea so i think uh, obviously the code of conduct has not been agreed upon but uh, the push that came around this time could be seen as uh, you know a consolidation formal consolidation of what was uh, what had happened in terms of changing facts in the waters we saw obviously in 2017 the first bri forum um, but by 2019 uh, you know when things had gotten far more difficult uh, because let's be clear this the trade and technology contestation between china and the united states uh, did uh, create a lot of uh, friction for beijing and it needed to adapt and it eventually thought that it should be adapting and you saw some degree of adapt- adaptation right because there was also pushback from other actors in the region uh, particularly with regard to bri debt sustainability uh, corruption and so on and so forth and what you saw was that by 2019 you saw adjustments in terms of how bri was being enacted you saw debt relief uh, discussions you saw you know uh, a pivot of bri towards farmers to being far more sustainable of course those that for that to take place and that to actually uh, be implemented in terms of projects it's a process it's time can it's going to take some time but we saw uh, the narrative being shifted uh, we saw china appearing far more accommodating we saw china adapting uh, to demands of different uh, actors in the region um and therefore show, you know from what it was in 2017 to when 2019 came you saw the sort of learning being taken on board and you saw slightly uh, much more uh, nimble effort than it was in the past um you obviously saw the informal summits between india and china between prime minister modi and xi jinping um the policy impact of this we can probably talk separately but uh, that was the adjustment that they made and at that point of time uh, you know it was very clear in some ways that this was a tactical adjustment that was being done uh, and to be honest both sides probably saw it exactly the same way that this is a tactical adjustment that be, that's being done by both sides there is nothing long term or strategic that's going on here um you saw a finally uh, you know the jain japanese prime minister shinzo abe visiting beijing uh in 2018 uh, for what was hailed at that point of time as a you know new beginning a new era and so on and so forth because uh, uh you know and a whole new set set of uh, agenda items being set up for the future for economic engagement uh, and for political engagement between china and japan um you saw obviously china emphasizing economic partnerships uh which uh sort of the RCEP and pressing ahead with RCEP emphasizing its sort of centrality to global supply chains uh, in terms of global trading the system um, and you saw the chinese talk about that uh, you also saw coercion which was evident uh, with australia and it gradually become far more intense uh, at least trading economic coercion with australia with india and other actors it was different um, and you also saw the phase 1 trade deal you saw those negotiations and you saw that trade deal happen uh, and the trade deal took place despite you know intense uh, rhetorical sort of uh, activity in beijing uh, you know if any if anybody remembers uh, at one point of time in 2019 if i'm correct uh, liu he who was the uh, was the vice premier and was chief negotiator uh, at one point of time after an agreement was apparently agreed uh, and then you know there was a fax there was these faxes that were sent which uh, you know uh, edited out a lot of uh, what had been agreed and then there was again friction and then liu he had this uh, thing about you know sovereignty and uh, unequal treaties uh, harking back to all of that um, so despite all of that narrative you still saw china willing to engage because it saw value in engagement uh, and willing to agree to a bunch of you know concessions uh, which to be honest were not necessarily uh deep and biting concessions but they were uh, public concessions of changes that needed to be made uh their impact would be you know it was still a, it was still a lot of we will try to do this uh while there were some tangible concessions there was also a lot of we will try to do this which is an acknowledgement that uh, you know say ipr issues are a problem um you also saw the foreign investment law so you saw some degree of accommodation uh, which suited also chinese interests so not accommodation was not sort of uh, giving away concessions uh, for the sake of but it they also suited chinese interests uh, but you saw at least that accommodation play out 
um, in the hope that you know this contest does not get far more uh, aggressive, far more difficult for China. Because as their external environment becomes far more difficult, it sort of uh, hinder, uh, hurts overall strategic interest. Finally, in terms of the post-COVID world, um, this is very recently from People's Daily, and I want to share this with you just to give you a sense of what is the worldview of the Chinese leadership. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick time check. Okay, yeah. So this is just to give you a sense of what is the worldview of the Chinese leadership at present, right? I mean, uh, and this is repeated uh, ad nauseum in official statements, in speeches, um, in the pages of the People's Daily. What you will see is then talk about the fact that look, there is tremendous change taking place in the world. Um, obviously, unilateralism, protectionism, and hegemonism is related, is deferred, is sort of code for the United States policies, um, and the idea that those pose a threat to world peace and development, or to essentially China's development, um, and therefore China's development will face much more headwinds. Um, but there is a sense that there is time and momentum that is on China's side, uh, which is where its determination lies. Uh, and why is that time and momentum on China's side is because, uh, you know, uh, of the Chinese economy, of the Chinese system. And this sort of sense has gotten far more, uh, it's gotten far more stronger uh, over the last year or so, uh, owing to China's ability to have contained the pandemic with, uh, you know, not insignificant, but comparatively insignificant loss of human life, at least officially from what we know when you compare it to say India or the United States or other parts of the world, um, the, you know, the sort of the Western world, uh, or uh, also China's ability to have sort of restarted its economy and to have managed those domestic challenges. So there's a, there's a tremendous amount of confidence therefore uh, domestically, but that confidence is coupled with this sense of caution, concern uh, and anxiety. Uh, and that's a feature of a lot of what how China sort of views the world, right? And its policies eventually emerge from a mix of uh, confidence today, which is bordering on hubris, but also tremendous anxiety about the stability and the future of the Communist Party's rule. Um, so this is essentially, in a nutshell, what the leadership's worldview is. That firstly, China today is a major power. Um, there is an acknowledgement that, of course, if you look at per capita GDP and all, China is still far away from developed countries. But there is a sense that it's today a major power. It's made certain strate strategic achievements, one of which being eradication of power, elimination of absolute poverty or achieving the objective of a moderately prosperous society by 2020. Um, and there is, say, expanding military which has interests worldwide it's a key actor on the global stage it is an indispensable economic partner to a whole host of countries around the world um, i think the economist last week or so or a couple of weeks ago had that map which showed the shift of uh, i should have used that map uh, it showed the shift of uh, you know trading partners uh, over the past few decades and that's one of the key reasons for the source of strength, right? That China is economically indispensable. Um, you know, for everything that's happened in Ladakh uh, in April and May, when we needed, uh, you know, healthcare products and ventilators and masks and whatever else, uh, or if we've needed APIs for pharmaceutical manufacturing, China is a key part of that supply chain. Um, so despite everything, we, you know, and even the even the sort of support that was coming from partner nations was being sent imported via China in many cases. So I think that's something to keep in mind because that's something that uh, is a key factor in the leadership's worldview in terms of its place in China's place in the world and its uh, core strength. Um, there's an acknowledgement that there are unprecedented changes underway in the world. What are these unprecedented changes? Well, fundamentally, apart from the whole bit about hegemonism and all of that, which is narrative, you also see that uh, the balance of power from a Chinese point of view is shifting from the West to the East. Uh, and again, this is something that you will read repeatedly. Uh, and if you've sort of gone back to Xi Jinping's July 1st speech, what you will see is that uh, he's essentially, his, his assertiveness is partly sort of uh, a product of this confidence uh, and partly a product of uh, the sense that China has a key role to play in the world and it has sort of arrived. Um, but there is a sense that there is still a shift in balance of power happening. Um, and uh, while that continues to happen, you will see far greater friction. Um, and that friction will take different forms, whether it's 
competition over technology whether it's competition over trade whether it's competition over values and values not in the abstract sense of values but also how those values inform global governance norms whether it's in regard to human rights or with regard to technology governance uh, or with regard to climate change or with regard to standards uh, going forward so uh, there is that sense that's going to happen um amid all of this there is a win- the window of strategic opportunity for china continues to persist um that's the leadership perspective and that's again because of all these fundamental strengths that i have outlined now that they believe that this persists uh, it's also because domestically they believe uh, you know they're in a position where you know the scale of economic growth is much higher there is an increasing uh, shift towards consumption driven growth this to me is still uh, something that is a core weakness of the chinese economy uh, you know it's not driven by consumption the way that they way uh, it that they would the way that they would that they would like it to be um it's still heavily reliant on investment um, but the idea is that you know uh, where you were to where you are uh, there are key vulnerabilities in core technologies and so on but uh, the overall sort of scale of technological innovation has increased consumption has become fast better uh, and it will continue to drive future sort of growth and i think in some ways if you look at it even state consumption is consumption so if you know the state is a big buyer uh, it will also be uh, although that's inefficient in the long run but that's something that they are continuing to look at um and therefore they believe that the window of strategic opportunity still persists that there is still no appetite for a sort of block confrontation uh, but uh, there are headwinds uh, but there's still no appetite for something like that uh, and china still has much more many more options and cards to play Uh, and predominantly because of its economic strength um finally uh, because of the fact that you know uh, all of this is taking place and you know competition is intensifying yet there are opportunities uh, technology at the end of the day is going to be a key factor determining where china ends up in the global pecking order um and there is confidence about china's sort of industrial scale and its ability to sort of uh, upgrade its industrial scale um there is a clear sense that uh, china that the chinese leadership wants to focus on uh, going up the industrial value chain sort of becoming a high uh, quality automated uh, industrial power uh, manufacturing power as opposed to necessarily a services power um, and uh, the effort is sort of going in that direction right now all of that is important because you know china has at present given its sort of deep uh, supply chain networks uh, in the region and globally um it will remain therefore a critical partner for many countries in the region so from an indo pacific point of view it therefore remains deeply deeply relevant um and that again will become a source of strength when it comes to the geopolitics of the indo pacific um but in all of this at present what we are seeing is that beijing is increasingly talking about self reliance uh, because there is a fear that uh, there is an effort to choke it and choke its technological sector uh, by uh, leveraging the vulnerabilities uh, that it has uh, and therefore it's sort of turning much more inwards towards uh, self reliance again how effective all of this is we'll have to wait and see but that's what the world view is today and that's what pol- that's what is driving policy um in terms of sort of the relationship with the united states and therefore its implications for the indo pacific um in june 2020 this is going uh, veteran diplomat uh, senior diplomat who sort of talked about the sense that you know and i think if you look at even what uh, recently you had the chinese foreign minister say uh, it, it was very clear that they were talking about uh, the three priorities that they have with regard to the united states and the first of those was ideological which was and i think this has been said again repeatedly over the past year and a half two years which is that you need to accommodate our system you need to appreciate our system um and then obviously the other idea was you know uh, you need to roll back some of the policies that you've enacted over the last couple of years but this sense over the over time has sort of set in that you know there is a systemic ideological competition that is playing out um there is very little introspection with regard to how chinese policies have uh, led to some of this uh there's very little intersection of that and none of that at least even if it is there 
we don't see it uh, in official discourse and we don't see it in policy uh, so that's uh, something that's troubling because there is there is a need for china to interfere in terms of its policies uh, but there is a sense that there is intense competition and that competition is not just for the commanding heights of the future of the global economy but also ideological uh, which if you think of it from a chinese communist party point of view it's not just ideological it therefore is existential uh, because you will fundamentally alter uh, the party itself so i come to threat perceptions the threat perceptions are of systemic competition i've already spoke about spoken about that the other threat perception is this and this has been something that's been sort of you know the last 3 4 years and i've spoken about this previously in this presentation the idea that uh, you know and you see here you hear this narrative a lot from chinese analysts uh, and official media and even uh, foreign ministry spokespersons is that uh, you know there is a sense that uh, in the in the united states the debate has moved and the discussion has moved uh, increasingly towards again identifying china as a uh, strategic threat and uh, therefore reorganizing policy to contain that strategic threat um, and the uh, the difference is that it's not just that there is a threat perception in the united states but from a chinese point of view the argument is that that threat is being created to be able to reorganize sort of the economy society and do all of that so it's a sort of choice that's being made uh, while it might not be entirely true and i think if in the last week if you heard that phrase that was used that oh the united states policy is based on this uh, imaginary adversary of china um that's the narrative that they're trying to put out but the threat is that uh, and uh, i think there's very little that they're doing to mitigate that threat but that's a concern and that's a sense of threat that uh, remains uh, within beijing um there's a fear obviously that all of this uh, the indo pacific uh, and us policy previously under president trump now under president biden is aimed at containing china increasingly china has become far more uh, vocal about this uh, and actually used phrase like containment which previously were not necessarily used by officials uh, high ranking uh, government officials uh, we've seen that there is a concern increasingly with what china calls small circles and cliques uh, and this is obviously used in the context of the quad quite frequently but the idea that you know that the united states and its allies are looking at some sort of segmented globalization um, in which you will sort of leave china out again there is a certain belief that that's going to be extremely costly and difficult to do because uh, it's very difficult to leave china out uh, but at the same time uh, there is a deep fear with regard to this and therefore you see this fear constantly come out uh, in whether it's with regard to what's happening uh, uh, with regard to the traceability issue of the origins of covid-19 uh where again the fear is that you know uh, there are these small cliques which are coming out whether it is whether it is with regard to issues of values and human rights whether it's with regard to military partnerships whether it's with regard to economic partnerships or trade partnerships uh you're seeing this constant fear about some sort of groups being created uh, or you know and those groups essentially uh, excluding china targeting china in one way or the other whether it's a quad whether it's a d10 uh whether it's something else uh, whether it's transatlantic partnership or nato uh you know because nato also in its latest statement did acknowledge china as a challenge uh, so there is a lot of the sense that this group formation is increasing which will be very different from say your conventional understanding of a cold war because different actors have different interests uh but you can create issue based groups and that's what china is pointing at and there's a recognition of that that this can be problematic um military and economic threats pretty straightforward these groups essentially focus on different different activities and different different domains and those can become threatening um again on in south china sea in the east china sea uh we've seen part of this sort of play out uh, afghanistan uh, in the indo pacific if i was to look at it as that look at it as within the broader indo pacific is a key concern and possibly an area where there can be some collaboration but increasingly we are seeing china taking a different road with it comes to its afghanistan policy and its other threat perception is with regard to uh long arm jurisdiction which is uh, you know the phrase that they've used with regard to uh, sanctions uh, whether it's economic whether it's with regard to travel or visa restrictions uh, whether it's with regard to hong kong or currently with xinjiang 
or previously also with Tibet, uh, the idea that you know different tools are being used uh, and will be used increasingly in a coordinated manner by different countries to coerce China to be able to uh, to force it to sort of change its policies. Um, and that's the threat perception. And that's also something that they are seeing is playing out and therefore it amplifies the threat perception. And therefore you're seeing China lashing out and retaliating in different ways, uh, you know, partly in ways which are uh, clearly deeply problematic, uh, such as the case of uh, the two gentlemen, the two Canadians who are who have been detained for a very long time now in China on national security grounds. Uh, you know, very vague national security grounds, or even whether with regard to policies in Hong Kong. Um, in terms of perceptions of opportunities in the Indo-Pacific, um, of course, China's economic strength, that's a huge opportunity. I'm going to try and go through this fairly quickly because uh, I'm running out of time. Um, this, in, uh, you know, so the economic strength is an opportunity, right? And we saw this uh, during April and May, uh, where the argument was that, oh, look, it was our suppliers who are providing you all these goods uh, and, you know, who expedited production to be able to provide India all of this and support India. But also, you know, go back to that econo uh, that map in The Economist, which talks about uh, China's centrality to the global economic system today uh, and the global trading system today. And so that's a sense of opportunity that you can continue to leverage that, um, uh, how they're doing it, and whether they are successful in doing it is another matter given what just happened in the last couple of weeks with regard to China's technology factor. Um, the other thing is this, uh, you're, lev you're sort of exacerbating anxieties that states may have with regard to a Cold War sort of environment, with regard to a sense that you need to choose between one or the other. And the Chinese are sort of, therefore, even the smallest of things are being painted as block confrontation. Uh, which puts countries in the region who, you know, may want to be in different tents on different issues with other countries, but not in a certain camp. You put them in a difficult spot uh, so that you sort of start to narrow down their options uh, so that they can't end up choosing. And, and you leverage your economic might to do that. Um, so you're sort of using those anxieties with regard to this block confrontation, uh, which is not really developing, but you're using that to do this. Um, you're... Showcasing performance legitimacy, not just at home, but also abroad. Um, and this is really useful. Uh, again, uh, I go back to April and May, uh, the idea that, uh, and this sort of ties in with emphasizing the decline of the United States and its unreliability as a partner, uh, sort of harking back to the Trump administration uh, and pull out from certain agreements, or sort of talking about the fact that, uh, you know, um, it took so long for the United States to sort of uh, come up with a coherent response to what was happening in India in late April and early May. And the Chinese used that window to saying, look, we reached out so early, we offered support, uh, and the so-called close partner took so much time and is still sort of, you know, still sort of mired in a domestic discourse about vaccine nationalism and all of that. Um, and they've tried to sort of build that narrative. They've used every little opening to try and make that argument, uh, and not just with regard to India, but even others, wherever the opportunity presents itself. They have emphasized, uh, uh, you know, and again, this is see as an opportunity, uh, domestic pressures in democracy. So if you look at Chinese media, you will find, uh, you know, tremendous coverage of, uh, I mean, if you just go back and look at the last week, uh, Chinese media coverage, what you will see is that, uh, you know, the People's Daily has been talking about the resurgence of uh, COVID-19 cases in the United States. But uh, there is absolutely no mention of an outbreak in Nanjing and now in Beijing and other parts of the country. Um, so there is an emphasis on, uh, you know, failures of performance and uh, challenges and also domestic fissures in democracy. You know, uh, and that's open, right? So because democracies are open by nature, you see those fissures out there in public. Um, and the Chinese are sort of talking about that far much more uh, and using that to sort of shift the, you know, the moral standpoint, you know, and create an equivalence and then therefore inform policy. Uh, finally, that sort of informs values discourse, right? The idea that, look, we are saying everybody has their own pathway. Uh, we're not on a missionary drive to change the world. Um, and that sort of thing gets far more acceptance from their point of view. They're saying everybody should do their own thing. Uh, 
and you know nobody should get to define what values are whether it's democracy whether it's human rights whether it's freedom um, and the chinese definition of these is obviously very very different from what say we in the we in india or in the united states uh, would define as that and there are obviously differences also between how we approach freedom and say how the united states approaches freedom at a social level my final slide is about policy adjustments so therefore what have we seen we have seen a quest for equality um and this is played out in policy whether it's with regard to contestation on human rights whether it's with regard to trade whether it's with regard to say the sanctions regime whether it's with regard to any of that there is a sense that you need to treat us as an equal and if not we will do exactly what is needed to be done we we will take uh, quote and quote counter measures um even if those are sort of uh, uh, strategically uh, foolhardy um so there is a sense of quest uh, quest for equality there is a sense that uh, china is a major power and therefore it needs to exercise power because what's the point of being a major power and having all this capacity having all this exercise it for political ends um so therefore there is a greater risk tolerance in the exercise of that power um and we are seeing that in eastern ladakh uh, to my mind um there is economic and military coercion again if you have the power why would you not exercise it uh and unless you exercise it you don't get to know the limits of your power um there is a systems and narrative contestation a lot of talk has been about how uh, the west has been uh, and particularly the united states has been talking about a ideological contestation if you look at chinese media and if you look at what the chinese leadership is saying they too talk about an ideological contestation it's different they're not looking to export their model uh they're not looking to export revolution uh, but uh, there is a systemic competition that's playing out um at the same time there is an effort to expand what is called a circle of friends uh, just go back through this last year and you will see tremendous outreach to european countries uh, serbia uh, hungary uh, portugal uh, finland most recently you will see tremendous outreach to not just uh, western european countries or major powers in europe like france and germany but also to all these other countries uh, and the effort is to try and expand uh, china's circle of friends uh, i haven't yet mentioned russia but of course uh, there's far greater congruence in uh, how both of them are acting uh, despite whatever anxieties might be uh, so there's an effort to sort of expand also your own group or clique uh, and see what you can do with that uh at the same time there is domestically uh, greater uh, centralization in policy making this has been happening over a period of time and this has an impact in terms of what happens in the indo pacific in the indo pacific um because the more you sort of emphasize top level design the less policy discussion policy discourse and contestation there is uh internally and the less course correction takes place and the more path dependence sets in um there's a greater emphasis on party control uh, across the board uh, we are seeing this with the private sector uh, increasingly last year she was talking about having patriotic entrepreneurs uh, this year we are seeing a far stronger crackdown on the technology sector for many different reasons uh, but essentially it is the party ex- uh, exercising far greater control uh, over private capital which again has an has an impact on how trade and uh, technological engagement and all of that happens within the indo pacific um finally uh, there's an emphasis on uh, ideology at home this ideology is a mix of uh, redness nationalism uh, but also political loyalty being emphasized uh, which creates challenges again in terms of uh, the nimbleness of policy adaptability uh, the ability to course correct Uh, and also when you emphasize ideology in this sense you end up in a position where uh, your threat perception heightens and you securitize everything so if you look at the idea of xi jinping's overall national security concept everything is securitized and when everything is securitized you end up in a position where uh, you end up exercising far more control and you lose the ability to innovate far more freely um, but at the same time he's talking about innovation and he's talking about development uh, and the desire is to be able to direct capital direct fund uh, direct talent uh, all of that uh, towards you know future technologies uh, emerging technologies and to sort of capture the frontiers of emerging technologies 
uh, which can then fuel domestic development. Um, again, these sound at cross purposes and they are in some way, uh, but that's China for you. Uh, there's always a contradiction in what's being done. With that, I will stop and happy to take any questions. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation. In fact, um, I always enjoy your classes here or in Takshashila. Um, so we will now open it for a virtual floor for discussion. Um, so probably I will read uh, the questions that are already in the chat to start with. Um, Amrita, are you there? Can you, would you like to ask? Okay. Uh, yeah. um, Mr. Kevin, I really, really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, you've partly sort of answered this, but I still wanted to know uh, what does, does China really think that BRI can be credibly challenged with all these alternatives that are coming up? And uh, also the these initiatives that want to move manufacturing out of China. Does China take it seriously or what is their perception of business? Do they think they will actually will be executed? Thank you. Hey, so thanks so much. Thanks so much for that question. Let me quickly sort of talk firstly about BRI. I mean, I think we tend to sort of uh, misinterpret BRI when we refer, when we think of it only from an infrastructure development perspective. BRI is much broader. broader. Uh, in some ways, it's uh, everything and it's nothing in that sense, right? It's sort of amorphous. Um, it uh, it talks about not just infrastructure, but it also talks about uh, connectivity. It talks about uh, policy coordination. It talks about financial linkages. Um, it talks about people-to-people -people connectivity and the rest of it. Uh, some of it becomes tremendously frivolous. So a new flight between Chengdu to another city in the, the UK or somewhere else becomes a BRI achievement. Uh, so some of it therefore becomes tremendously frivolous, um, but some of it is far more deeper than just infrastructure. Because uh, if you look at, say, the setting up of Chinese payment uh, service providers, Union Pay and the rest of them in Russia, um, it's under the rubric of BRI. It allows you to get finances. It allows you to get priority placement. It allows you to clear policy hurdles to get into the market. But it builds connections which are far deeper. Um, so in that sense, I don't think China looks at what's happening with regard to the initiative that was recently launched after the G7 uh, bill, something I can't remember, B3W, I think it was. Um, I don't think uh, it looks at uh, these as fundamentally challenging BRI because uh, there is tremendous space for infrastructure development in other parts of the world, and it's perfectly fine. Also, uh, there is still something to happen. You know, there's monies that need to be committed to these. Uh, these need to be coordinated. They need to deliver. Uh, and for a recipient country, uh, which, uh, you know, these countries who are part BRI partners have agency. For them, why would I throw away somebody else's money? When I'm getting money from both places, I will hedge and I will take and I will say, great, uh, it allows me greater maneuverability when I have other, other actors there. So it gives me better choices, yes, uh, and it may constrain some of China's choices, but that is still to happen. Uh, I don't think they are terribly worried about it at present uh, because they see BRI as much broader uh, than just infrastructure. The second question, I'm a little, uh, what was the question again? It was about? Um, take a note of alternatives to uh, push out manufacturing out of China elsewhere. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I should take a note of the question before I answer. I, I think that at present, data does not support this. Um, if you look at data from the American Chamber of Commerce and the European Chamber of Commerce, um, I, re I mean, I recall quite clearly the European Chamber of Commerce data. It said last year that about 11% of European companies in China were looking to potentially exit the market. Um, whether they did or not is uh, second, I don't know as yet. But what I do know is that the current data point tells us that it's only 9% uh, in this year. So far fewer countries are even, companies are even looking to exit. Uh, if you look at FDI into China, uh, it's uh, extremely strong. It was extremely strong last year. It's extremely strong this year so far. So I don't think that's happening. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think that's happening. Uh, and companies, uh, yes, there is a political logic that's increasingly going to shape economic decision making. 
but at present we are not at the point where uh, that is forcing uh, a bulk of the firms who are operating in china to exit and even if they do sort of uh, i don't think you'll see an exit what you may see is some degree of resilience on say whatever is defined as critical sectors so you will see some degree of uh, investments to do china plus something uh, particularly when it comes to sort of critical infrastructure but again very early days for these conversations to happen my sense is that the bulk of manufacturing will remain in china because uh, uh, how do you have access to that market firstly secondly apart from the market there is a tremendous connectivity within china there is tremendous ease of business within china so if you tomorrow shift to even india that ease of business environment from a policy point of view to an infrastructure point of view to a supply chain connectivity point of view is going to take time to build um so immediately i don't see those things happening but if cards are played well yes uh there will be far more uh, there will be some degree of exodus and of course a lot of this depends on chinese policy itself um if you are going to see the kind of policy uncertainty in the last few months that we have seen with regard to the technology sector in china um if you are going to see increasing preference to chinese companies uh, and again this sort of complete uncertainty that you've seen um you will see firms wanting to leave um you know that's china's own policies also um and lastly i think i would add particularly on say key technology if you and i think from my understanding this is still a conversation that's going on between the quad the us japan uh, is what do you define as critical in say a certain technology if it's facial recognition what component of it is critical um what component of the research is critical um and i'm hoping that our uh, technology working group under the quad can answer some of these questions um so that then you can start to have harmonization in policy and saying okay this you can't do and this is where we place our firewalls um and then you sort of start to take away some business and opportunities sure. yeah we um this one question in the chat i mean this is into a in a fictional scenario if india proposes to join bri to return for indo china border settlement do you think china is going to buy into this proposition bri is not only about depth trap um conducted fairly india will also gain from the ease of trade in bri yeah i mean i don't think that bri will bring any trading benefits to us um you know so uh look firstly it's going to be a huge political challenge for any indian government to formally sign on to bri um i you know it's just not going to happen uh, it's really difficult to do that uh, you can name bri something else uh, and then maybe get some sort of a conversation going uh, but your fundamental issues with regard to sovereignty uh, in pakistan occupied kashmir uh, will remain you know so those challenges will remain secondly what is the incentive uh, for china to resolve the boundary issue as a trade off for bri um, you know uh, what do you get by india signing on to bri how is india obstructing bri um what we have seen in the last few years is that india alone uh, has very little capacity to shape uh, or has demonstrated very little capacity to shape economic outcomes in the region um it, it uh, its investment needs to be far greater its connectivity with south asia needs to be far greater um and we have not done that as well as we should be doing it you know we've in fact uh, had far greater friction so if we do step up uh, our game much more in the region i think that yes there is uh, clearly uh, something that uh, you know that that the chinese would take sort of worry about but at present we're not going to be able to match them dollar for dollar or rmb for rmb uh so you know that's not a game that we should be playing we've talked about value sustainable projects and so on and so forth but has our delivery of those projects really worked out um have we become the engine of prosperity in the region that rest of the countries in the region want to uh, work with no uh, so if we get those things right uh, our economic right if uh, our prosperity right and become far more open become that engine of prosperity for the region um then yes then th- this is the kind of conversations that you can have uh, and this is sort of it brings you to the negotiating table with china far strongly um even if you do that 
I don't think the Chinese will want to resolve the border issue. Uh, to me, they have no incentive to resolve it. Um, they have repeatedly told us that we are five times larger than you. We are a far bigger power. We, uh, you know, uh, and we are a far stronger military than you, far more advanced, and so on and so forth. Um, why would a power like that make a concession? Um, what would we give them in return, uh, even if we sign up to BRI? Um, if they ask us that we want you to remain non-aligned in our contest with the United States, um, you know, we are still non-aligned. We are not an we are not an ally. We are not a formal ally of the United States. We are working with the United States in what is in our interest. Um, so there is absolutely. Uh, even if you were to say yes, we are non-aligned. I mean, uh, if you go back and read the Prime Minister's speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue when he spoke about, spoke about the Indo-Pacific strategy, I don't know how much more clear can one be that we are non-aligned. You know, and in return, what has happened is that we have faced more coercion. Uh, so, I, so I don't think that there is any incentive uh, in Beijing. There is any grand bargain that they are going to offer us, uh, and certainly not for joining BRI. Because I think they figured out that BRI can operate even without uh, India being there. Does India make does India being part of that network make it easier? Yeah, but you know, uh, it's okay. They are prepared for a contest in the region as they expand their presence in the Indian Ocean. Um, and when we sign on to BRI, we have to also acknowledge that we will accept and we will normalize Chinese naval presence in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, does that work for us? Uh, I don't think so. Um, at least not normalization of it, right? Uh, you know, uh, and at least we need to have clearer red lines with regard to what they do. But if you sign on to BRI, then you end up in a position where, you know, your negotiation power sort of dips a little bit more when it comes to those issues. Excellent. Um, is it possible to pacify Chinese perceptions without giving away core values for countries from the Indo-Pacific region? If yes, what could be the best way to do so? Ritulaj. Yeah, I mean, I. I don't think we need to. I don't think anybody needs to pacify. Look, I mean, if you look at uh, what's happened, particularly in the last few months, uh, there is outrage every day about something or the other uh, from the Chinese foreign ministry. Um, you know, whether it is even something as uh, inane as why is it that our Olympians, the images of our Olympians, are so distorted uh, and they are not looking nice. Uh, you know, so you, there's no sense of pacifying. And I don't think this is a case of pacifying. Uh, Chinese perceptions of threat, uh, you know, are not uh, imaginary. Uh, you know, they are, uh, uh, in terms of how they see the world and how they see their place in the world, they are not imaginary. Um, uh, their interests do uh, conflict with the interests uh, uh, of India in many places, with the interests of the United States in many places, of Japan, uh, Australia, uh, and of many other countries in the region. Um, there are obviously certain congruences in interest, but uh, some places where there are common interests. But uh, by and large, strategically, I think there is, uh, there is increasingly friction uh, in our interests. Um, and therefore, you're going to see this. So whatever you do, you don't end up pacifying that. Because at the end of the day, uh, unless you surrender what are your interests, I mean, I'll give you an example of the South China Sea. If tomorrow uh, the Chinese say that, look, um, we are going to, as part of a code of conduct, we are going to uh, insist that uh, no other state in the region, in, in the South China Sea region, periphery, can carry out naval drills with any external power. Uh, or no other state uh, can explore without everybody maybe agreeing. You know, okay. let's make it even that much, that sort of uh, accommodative. Um, why would an India say, okay, that works for us? That fundamentally restricts our interests. So, you know, so even if you say that, okay, we understand your anxiety, but you can't, you know, block us out of one of the world's most important waterways, um, and on what grounds? So, you know, to me, it's an interest issue more than a perception issue. The, but yeah, but Chinese perceptions uh, of their anxieties uh, and of their threats um, are based in reality. Uh, you know, they're not entirely, uh, you know, the degree may vary, but they're not entirely uh, out of sync with reality. This is a question from Yukti Panwar. 
um with the current context of uh, uh, with the current context uh, theories of uh, origin of covid-19 along with the taiwan issue in the hong kong um with other with many others how do you think that china will place itself in the paradigm shift that we have been witnessing for few years now so i think the covid-19 origin issue i mean uh difficult for me to say because i'm uh, epidemiology is not my thing <laughs> but uh, my sense is this right geopolitically i don't really see uh, the covid-19 origin issue becoming a big geopolitical fault line yes it's an issue at present and it will remain a matter of concern because it's an issue of trust it's an issue of global governance uh, and in and the functioning effective functioning of global governance institutions like the who um you know it's an issue of transparency and all of that but i don't sort of see it becoming a deep geopolitical file fault line what i see it doing is essentially um exacerbate existing tensions for a period of time um but uh, on the whole i don't sort of see it becoming a fundamental i don't see that becoming as the organizing principle of problems between different states i mean if you look at it over the past year if you think from an indian point of view or even from the point of view of a number of european countries um yes everybody wants uh, a more transparent investigation uh, but there's been very little public emphasis uh, on it at least from these countries um so yeah so i don't see that the major issue but of course yeah the more defensive beijing gets the more uh, uh, it arouses suspicions around the world as to what has happened and how transparent it has been um that said at present the evidence of it being a laboratory origin thing or any of that is very very thin there is uh, you know there is nothing that tells us that it is something like that um and i doubt that we will ever conclusively find it so you know uh, but then i'm like i said i'm not an epidemiologist so perhaps we will but i don't think we will um in terms of how china positions itself i mean i just see it as another factor currently for irrita- uh, as another irritant uh, in its relationship with the united states predominantly uh but also where other countries will fall but uh, yeah i mean i'm really happy to see that uh, uh you know in the last couple of weeks uh, beijing finally had to criticize the who um because for the last year and a half it has been using who comp statements to say look how wonderfully we've done um uh, suddenly the shoes on the other foot and i think to me that's uh, again it just tells you what happens when the united states engages with multilateral institutions rather than pulling out of them and it throws its weight and power behind them um sarav dutta gupta he congratulates you on the book uh, smokeless war and his question is uh, whether india has a clear and uh, visible policy for amalgamating economic political and military aim towards the indo pacific vision uh, is being a part of a group or a few groups the practical way or the multi uh, alignment policy with vaidhi uh, bhava sadgunya of a uh, the shastra the normal the new normal and the policy that india should actively follow economically politically and militarily okay so firstly thank you so much uh, for your good wishes in the book um so this is my view of indian policy um i think we've been a little bit uh, the first thing and i think again we need to take a leaf uh, out of what uh, president biden has said um you need to focus on domestic competitiveness first we need to make sure that our economic growth is back on track uh that is going to be the driver of uh, the key source of power and we need to make sure that that is back on track first and foremost um we need to uh, work with uh, like minded partners around the world uh shed some of our inhibitions with regard to that uh, you know we've been very inhibited in the past um i'm happy to see that we are less inhibited but yet i see that there is uh, still there is tremendous inertia which is expected uh, there is a long legacy of policy making in india and so that's expected but also uh, i'm happy to see that we are less inhibited uh, in terms of working with other partners uh, you know around the world um, i'm happy to see that you know we were part of uh, the g7 plus conversation that happened recently i'm happy to see our engagement with the united states more recently and with japan and with australia we need to do more of that we need to work with countries on issues Uh, and be in different tents on issues uh, and we need to actually uh, you know take that sort of a position as opposed to 
thinking of the world in camps because we are not there and uh, i don't think that given the economic engagement of the world and the structure of the world we will end up in a position where we are in strict camps uh, so we need to be on issue based tents with partners where our values align where our interests align um, both of those are extremely important um, lastly in our region in our immediate neighborhood it is extremely important for india to become the engine of growth in its neighborhood we cannot close ourselves down because of domestic policy imperatives and dem- sorry not policy imperatives domestic political imperatives we need to be open to the region we need to be the engine of growth for the region for that we need to invest in strength domestically we need to make sure that we liberalize our economy further we need to make sure that we are far more connected to the outside world because when we do that that's when we are prosperous we need to keep in check uh tendencies for um you know if for the lack of a better word uh, xenophobia uh, you know nativism we need to keep some of those tendencies in check um in our politics uh, and we need to focus more on a liberal open economic model where we can actually attract investment and be the powerhouse that we need to be we need to con- carry out factor market reforms we need to carry out uh regulation with regard to new technologies uh because uh, if you're developing all these technologies or if you wanted to invest in them the only way you will get investment is if you actually have a clear uh you know predictable regulatory ecosystem uh at present we don't have that so we need to focus a lot internally uh and externally i think you know so we've got the external idea right in many ways we've not got the domestic uh stuff right if we do that well i think we are well placed um just a small question from my side i mean just a curious thing uh how do you think the chinese diaspora in the indo pacific uh, countries like us and uh, other places uh view the indo uh, indo pacific geopolitical construct right so uh, i mean i don't i haven't uh, specifically studied this so i don't think uh, with what degree of I, i'm not sure what degree of confidence with which i can sort of answer this but my sense is that uh, there is a over emphasis on diaspora from beijing uh, you know uh, and sort of uh, and there is uh, a certain there is certain nativist tendencies uh, in different parts of the world where uh, you know which get clubbed with racist tendencies and you sort of see pushback and all of that um to people at the end of the day uh, people are interested in bettering their lives whether they are chinese whether they are indian whether they are american whether they are whatever else at the end of the day people are interested in bettering their lives we carry certain perceptions uh, with ourselves but at the end of the day to me fundamentally people are interested in that people are interested in have living a better life than say their parents lived and going on and you know giving a better life to their children and so on and so forth and that's universal so i think that uh, a lot of the debate that's happening with regard to you know there are serious there are security concerns with regard to you know specific research projects specific individuals and all of that but in generally i think we need to particularly as liberal democratic country we need to be uh, far more uh, relaxed uh, in our societies about some of these things you know our social strength uh, should eventually override some of these challenges but yeah but i don't honestly i would not have any idea of how the diaspora views uh i'm sure they're not necessarily happy about it because it starts to restrict mobility it starts to restrict opportunities so i'm sure nobody is terribly happy about it uh you know if i was an individual who was wanting to study in the uk or united states and if i see competition becoming geopolitically more intense and sort of restricting my travel uh restricting you know in- increased scrutiny on where i study how i do things uh or you know increased uh, social friction in the community that i end up going and living in um it creates pressures on me so to me i think that would be their primary sort of concern so i'm afraid we run out of time uh, but probably the last thing and briefly you can touch upon uh, sohana is ask asks uh, what will china's self reliance mean for the rest of the world for instance in terms of trade right so uh, interesting question right so uh, i would look at it from two prisms one is that uh, you know this is, they've been talking about the strategy of dual circulation um what it's basically trying to do is that it's trying to use uh, try, it's basically saying we're going to be open to capital we're going to be open to talent where we need it 
but we're going to be predominant try to be driven by domestic demand um, you know and we're going to try to make sure that we import because of that uh, you know, so imports will go up uh, so far we are not seeing that what we are seeing is china still exporting significantly uh, and a lot of that is because of the pandemic and its sort of dominance in supply chain but uh, we'll have to see particularly on trade how that plays out uh, my i don't foresee china cutting its trading relationship but it's clearly they're pre-prioritizing certain countries and bri countries to try and sort of diversify its trade engagement uh, as much as possible it's not easy to do governments can't do this by fiat uh, you know you can't tell companies where to go and sell whom to go and sell to but you can create a policy environment which makes it far more easier to trade with certain countries than with others so my sense is that we will see some of that uh, down the road uh, but i don't think that we will see china restricting trade uh in that sense uh, it restricts trade when it wants to politically right so you see uh, suddenly quality issues and non trade non tariff barriers come up uh, uh, quality issues and the rest of it come up when suddenly you have political frictions in certain countries to me that will continue the second thing with regard to technology and i think that's where this business of self reliance is really really important um i think what they are basically saying is this that uh, on certain core technologies we need to be self reliant um and that's predominantly a reaction uh, you know there was a tendency towards this but self reliant is extremely inefficient as a policy being self trying to be self reliant in some of these things because again some of these things are such globally network things i mean if you look at semiconductors uh, what does it mean to be self reliant in semi in the entire semiconductor supply chain it's madness it's not going to happen um so what you probably want to do is identify what is basic core technology and try to create self reliance in that so that you can't be choked and you know you don't end up becoming vulnerable there and this is i think this sort of lesson became far more deeply imbibed uh, during the trump years so therefore i think that's something that that you're going to see what it will see is that in if they are successful in this effort what you will end up seeing is that you will end up seeing a far more resilient china and a far more assertive china politically than it already is because you know you are, you have fewer levers given to other actors to try and choke you uh, or to try and direct your policy choices in one way or the other so if they succeed i think that's what will happen uh, it also means that they will be critical actors in terms of the global technology ecosystem they already are in some domains but it will become increasingly more so um if they don't succeed uh, then i think there will be tremendous political volatility so it's a bet that's been placed which is which can be quite uh, problematic down the road uh, but that's specifically with regard to core technologies um, you know and again what do you define as core technologies they have this whole gamut you know you put ai as a core technology but ai is so broad so there is so much under ai um you put semiconductors as a core element but semiconductors is so broad um so i think the effort is to be able to make sure that you are in a position that you don't end up becoming vulnerable um it's a long term effort it won't happen in a year or two um but yeah at the end of the day the outcome would be this if you, if they end up becoming far more self reliant even if inefficiently so um you reduce uh, levers that others may have uh, to exploit your vulnerabilities and you add to your own sort of arsenal to be able to coerce if you want to So, thank you manoj uh, we have uh, still many questions but i'm afraid uh, we have to stop here um, probably i can share those questions with you uh, after the session and maybe you can whenever you get time you can respond to that certainly i'd be happy to yeah. thank you thank you very much uh, amrita thank you for the question and for the beautiful perspective we now come to the last leg of this entire uh, workshop and uh, in this regard i would request uh, david moyer to come and uh, share his thoughts he is the public affairs officer of the us consulate in hyderabad i request you to share your perspective thank you very much fidar and it's really a special thanks to everyone at isb they are such a tremendous partner for the us consulate here in hyderabad so it's a guru shridhar and the entire team we really appreciate again your your friendship and your collaboration important conference today and i wasn't able to attend 
all of the sessions, but I did listen to Manoj's presentation. And uh, I think the final statement was very telling. He said, again, when it comes to China, there are always contradictions. So I won't add any comment, but uh, I think that was a good sum up of, of his uh, presentation. Um, hopefully we can do these kind of conferences in the future in person. I really look forward to interacting face-to-face uh, -face with everyone. Um, just a couple of uh, final comments. My, my colleague, Sean, commented this morning as he kicked off the conference about our um, Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, was in town in, in China or in India earlier this week, and he said a couple of things. I just wanted to reiterate those again. On China, since that's kind of where we ended the conference, he said, the most effective way to engage China is working with other countries that are similarly situated and that face similar challenges. India, of course, is a strong partner for the United States. He also said about the Quad, he said, deepening the Quad as a collaborative platform is in our mutual interest. We must work together even more closely on key contemporary challenges like terrorism, climate change, pandemics, and resilient supply chains. So that really echoes kind of what Manoj has talked about as the way forward and how the US views our relationship with India and other countries in the region. It's also interesting, in just this week, uh, China sent a new ambassador to the United States. And again, it struck the, the new ambassador struck a very positive tone in his initial comments to the meeting. He said, the China-US relationship has come to a new critical juncture facing not only many difficulties and challenges, but also great opportunities and potential. I really think that's and that echoes what um, the initial quote that Mano shared Secretary Blinken, that we're going to collaborate with China where we can, and we hope we can do uh, lots of collaboration. So, um, again, I wish I could have been here for all of the discussions today, but looking at the lineup that ISP put together, again, a, a top notch group of experts. And again, this is just laying the foundation for a much more comprehensive uh, discussion uh, early next year where we hope to have high level officials from not just the US and India, but from other partners in the region. So we can continue the discussion that we started today. So with that, again, thanks to the presenters, all the participants, and again, to Sridhar and the team over at ISB. Thanks for everything and appreciate your time. Thanks, thanks, Dave, for the remarks. Um, friends, uh, thank you all for spending the day with, uh, with us. In fact, I'm sure there are many takeaways um, at least for me, I can um, I can tell that I'm a scholar of uh, Indo-Pacific now. <laughs> um, so, in fact, uh, I'm I'm happy that uh, this has uh, happened at the right time. In fact, a uh, lot of discussions in this area is very important. And I like to, on behalf of ISB, I like to thank our friends from the U.S. Consulate for. Uh, thinking of ISB to, for organizing such interesting series of sessions. Um, of course, there are more to come and uh, we will keep uh, working with you on this. Uh, and then we, uh, we could together do a similar session earlier uh, for the journalists actually, and that was uh, well received. Um, and I'm happy that uh, you all can access the uh, videos that are there in the uh, ISB External Relations YouTube channel. So that will also help you enhance your uh, understanding on these issues. Um, I'm uh, happy to see a very good response for this. I mean, for the entire day, we have almost 100 uh, uh, scholars who continuously attended it and uh, they really earned the event. Thanks for uh, uh, being with us. Um, special thanks to uh, Sean Rute. David uh, Moyer and uh, Salil Kadir, without whose support, uh, we will not be able to do this. And I'm very grateful that uh, we are working together and very thankful. Um, I also thank the four faculty uh, experts today, uh, Vice Admiral Retired Girish Lutra, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, uh, Amrita and uh, uh, Manoj. Uh, it was a real uh, pleasure for all of us to listen to all of you. And, and also uh, for helping us to spread the message of uh, this event uh, from through your contacts and many of them attended and learned a lot from those things. Um, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Netaji Abhinandan from Orissa who actually helped us to um, uh, 
spread the news uh, in Odisha, in the universities in Odisha. Uh, especially, he is actually a co-founder for this Kalinga Institute of uh, Indo-Pacific uh, Studies in in Orissa, along with uh, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra. Uh, so, thank you all. Thanks for the scholars. Uh, I'm glad to note that the response to the workshop is very good, and uh, it's geographically spread across the state. Actually, um, we had participation from almost uh, all the states to uh, and from various universities um, like uh, Assam, West Bengal, Odisha, AP, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Karnataka, New Delhi, Punjab. I mean, just if I could see the list, I could make out that all these states are well covered. I, I must thank my own team in ISP for making this possible. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Naman Sharma, who is behind the scene working uh, very hard, Prashant Srivastava and Sandeep. Uh, thanks to Kumar Guru for leading us from the front. Um, I would urge all of you to follow the social media handles of ISP section relations uh, and keep you uh, yourself updated on our uh, initiatives. Um, in fact, if you could subscribe uh, and visit that YouTube channel that I was talking about, you will have more information about uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, aspects. So with that note, uh, I thank once again and uh, uh, have a great weekend. And of course, a lot of takeaways you can start writing uh, based on this. Thank you. Thank you. So you can close now. So